welcome to Cassidy and our online services this morning as we prepare our hearts to worship God. Just wanted to let you know of several announcements and things going on in the life of the church. Uh, we will be suspending worship, physical worship here in the sanctuary until further notice, unfortunately. So still be in prayer for uh, our church as well as those affected by the virus. Also, though, to compensate or to make up for that, to, to stay connected to the church tomorrow uh, morning starting at 9 o'clock, we have several prayer stations that are set up throughout our sanctuary, and we invite you to come in uh, between 9 and 12 tomorrow morning or 6 to 8 tomorrow evening and worship through these prayer stations. And I think that it'll be a, a meaningful experience for you and an opportunity again to worship here in our in the house of God and to be present here. Uh, also, it, please let me remind you that the needs of the church continue to go on. We need your continued support financially to make sure our staff and utilities and other things are financed and uh, taken care of. So if you can bring your offerings or mail your offerings in, we would much appreciate it. Uh, on a praise note this morning, last week we had over 600 In that, we find that God's love will be poured out in our lives. So let's worship the Lord this morning as we sing. Wherever you are, maybe still in your pajamas, maybe sitting on your porch enjoying the beautiful sunshine at the breakfast table, go ahead and lift your voice with us, because God inhabits the praise of his people. Sing with us.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we come into your presence to pour ourselves out for you. Everything we have, not counting the cost, but striving to be obedient, striving to surrender all that we are, striving to follow you faithfully. So as we worship this morning, we remember those who are not present with us, who are at home worshiping online, who are struggling. We remember Susan Alley. We lift her up for her broken arm. We lift up George Hayes. We lift up Jeanette Rotifer. We lift up Will Malcolm and Kevin Kay. We lift up those who are struggling physically and spiritually and emotionally to you, Lord. And we lay them down before you in the throne room of heaven for your care, your protection, your nurture, and your love to cover them, to bring healing and wholeness to their lives. So, Lord Jesus, we ask that you just pour out your Holy Spirit upon us now as we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving, strengthened and encouraged by your word, so that we may be faithful in our walk with Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the Psalms. It's Psalm 45. As you listen to these words, um, listen for how the heart speaks through the writings. Psalm 45. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skilled writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your side, Almighty One. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously on behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set before your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant, fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride and gold of a fur. Listen, O daughter, consider and give ear. Forget your people and your house and your father's house. The king is enthralled by your beauty. Honor him, for he is your lord. The da daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. Men of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess. Within her chamber, her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her and are brought to you. They are led in with joy and gladness. They enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers, and you will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory throughout all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. heard the psalmist offer praise to God in a, in a wedding song. 
And there was anointing that was occurring throughout that song. Our second reading today is taken from Mark chapter 14, verses 3 through 11. Hear these words. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. I tell you the truth, whenever, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done also will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. So we watched for an opportunity to hand him over. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, God. be to God. Well, this morning we continue in our series that we've been on, looking at the events of the last week. In Jesus's life snapshots pictures if you will paintings close-ups like this painting here that our guest artist Sandra Hardin painted about this text from Mark's gospel the anointing of the feet and the head of Jesus so as we continue today that's our focus this beautiful gift given by this unnamed woman honoring Jesus. We know love is, is an amazing thing. Poets write about it. Songs are written about it. We talk about it often. There was a particular young man who was preparing to ask his girlfriend to marry him. And so he went out and he bought a ring. And he was so excited that he showed his ring, the ring to his friends. And one of the friends spoke up and said, wow. Is that a real diamond? And the young man said, I hope so, or I'm out 20 bucks. <laughs> then there was another guy who uh, wanted to show how much he loved his, his girlfriend. And so he went to one of those expensive high-end apartment stores and he was going to get her some expensive perfume. So as he went up to the clerk at the counter, he asked to, to be helped and to show what's the best perfume. And the, and the lady behind the counter said, well, we have this scent. It's very, very popular. It's called Perhaps. And it costs $200 for an ounce. The young man kind of was shocked. He said, for $200, I want more than perhaps. I want for sure. But seriously, within those bits of humor, those little tidbits and stories, we all know that that's not really how we view love, is it? We don't count the cost. We're willing to give all of ourselves. We're willing to act extravagantly, even nonsensically. We're willing to drive throughout the night to see our beloved. We're willing to do whatever it takes to please them and to make them happy, to fill their lives with joy. We're willing to even go sometimes in debt to buy extravagant gifts or pay for vacations in order to show how much we love them. There's a recklessness in that kind of love that we feel for one another, those special, special people in our lives, isn't there? It doesn't count the cost. It doesn't calculate the less or the more. And if we could give all the world 
it still really wouldn't be enough to express those deepest emotions that fill our hearts and overflow. And this unnamed woman teaches us that kind of extravagant love. A love of abandoned praise and how sometimes love isn't sensible. That love is often extravagant. Sure, sometimes it looks like a waste and the extravagance doesn't make sense. And out of those emotions we want to feel, we're tempted to lose touch with all of reason and, and logic. We do things we wouldn't normally do. Things to show extravagant love. And that's what Mary does. Now I say Mary because while in Mark and Matthew's gospel she's an unnamed woman, Luke and John name her. She's the sister of Martha, the brother or the sister of Lazarus. So we'll call her Mary from here on out. And what she did was beautiful. Now, it was customary in that time to anoint the heads of honored guests as they gathered for dinner. It was customary that they would be anointed with expensive oils. It was customary that rabbis who were highly thought of would also be anointed. And throughout the scriptures, we can find places in which kings and prophets and priests were anointed as well. Or... As Jesus says in the text, she's preparing him for burial. It was customary to anoint those who had passed on. So that's not so different, is it? But Mary's anointing goes farther. It goes far, much farther, in fact, beyond the customs of the day. Mary is breaking through all sensible boundaries at this point. She's not even supposed to be there. She would have been off to the side, and yet she interrupts the gathering to bring this special gift, the beautiful gift of anointing. She, she is, in fact, proclaiming that Jesus is indeed the Messiah, the Savior, the Son of God. That he's also our high priest. He's also the King of kings and God's highest, highest prophet. But in this text, we also get a different picture of that relationship Mary is expressing through Jesus. She's also saying, you're my groom. You're my partner. You're my companion. So if we take a deeper look, as Pastor Lori Wagner has done, we see that there are many similarities and metaphors to Jewish customs about marriage and about marriage as a metaphor of our relationship with God. After all, the church is called the bride of Christ. And so let's take a deeper look. And now I don't want you to get too wrapped up in this metaphor about marriage. I'm not suggesting that Mary is anointing Jesus because Jesus and Mary will be married. No, no, no. I'll leave that to Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and all those conspiracy theorists. You can watch the movie or read the book. It's good fiction. Fiction. Let me emphasize that. Well, the covenant of marriage is very powerful throughout all of Scripture. In fact, our Catholic brothers and sisters see it as a sacrament. It's that powerful because it points to our relationship with God. It points to how we're supposed to live out that relationship like the closest of all human relationships, marriage. You see, we should have a passion for God. And it's not meant to be, so it's not meant to be an intellectual exercise where we crawl into our heads and try to figure out all these little intellectual tidbits. No, no, no. It's supposed to meant to be highly emotional. It's supposed to be consuming. It's supposed to be passionate. And even intimate, we were meant to long for God. When God breathed life into us, he created us to be loved. And he created us to love others with extravagant love, just as Mary expresses in this anointing. 
We were meant to submit our hearts and our minds, our bodies and our spirits to God, just like we would do in a marriage relationship, in that covenant between a man and a woman and God. The scripture says this. A woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. Now, I've already alluded to the fact that all four Gospels contain this story of the anointing of Jesus by Mary. And John goes on further to explain that not only did Mary anoint the head of Jesus, but she also anointed his feet as well. You know, one of the interesting customs in Jewish marriage ceremonies is the breaking of the glass. You think about that as Mary breaks the alabaster jar open. And the breaking of the glass has powerful meaning. It's a symbolic way of shattering our own life and embarking into a new life that will hopefully be unbreakable. We hope that every marriage is unbreakable. We pray that every marriage is unshakable. We pray that every marriage is filled with hope. But other traditions going back farther to the time of Jesus note it as something even deeper than that. The Talmud says this, where there is rejoicing, there should also be trembling. While it's a very joyful thing to be involved in a wedding and to be married, as one enters the married marriage covenant, we also know that that's a serious time, isn't it? On the one hand, we're filled with joy, and if you talk to any bride or groom, the nerves are just going 100 miles an hour on that day, right? Because it's joyful, and yet, wow, this is for life. I'm going to marry this person and we're going to be sharing life together for a really long time. And what if it doesn't work? And what if this happens? And what if that happens? So on the one hand, there's joy. On the one hand, there's that weight of responsibility, that weight of obligation, that weight of surrendering ourselves to give ourselves fully to the other. And so there's that thing, that tension. And Mary used the perfume for the ceremonial anointing, breaking the jar from the alabaster container, a jar that might also be thought of as breaking the glass in the wedding celebration. Now think about that breaking metaphor for a moment, that imagery. She brought her own brokenness to Jesus that day. She wasn't supposed to be in there. The women were supposed to be off separate. But she risked it all for Jesus. She gave her brokenness to him in this sweet, sacrificial, beautiful act of servanthood that was both sweet and bitter at the same time. And Jesus, the Messiah, is the heartbreaking and beautiful gift broken for our sakes. The beautiful gift that God gives for all of us. His blood is poured out. He's broken. And so too, Mary breaks through all those social norms, all the expectations. She dares to, to do something that others might talk about, to risk her own reputation, to be reprimanded and rebuked. But she doesn't care. She doesn't care what other people think or what other people are going to say. In a sheer act of humility, she pours out the oil and devotion to our Savior. Anointing him in a prophetic act that will define his journey to the cross. She broke that alabaster jar. And as she broke the jar, she entered into a new relationship with Jesus. Stepping out fully in faith. Acknowledging who Jesus was, Lord, King, Prophet, Savior. And the breaking of the jar started a new relationship between Mary and Jesus. It was a new covenant. It was the fulfillment of God's promise that he would send a Messiah to save us from ourselves. 
And Mary recognized that the time had come. Mary, more than anyone else, knew the significance of this time, these last days of Jesus' life. Now, if Jesus were, uh, if the Jewish customs, rather, are correct and, and sources are correct about what goes on in a marriage ceremony and beforehand and the whole uh, courting phase and so forth, the power in this act is that Mary is literally giving her entire life to Jesus. Jewish custom often said that perfumes such as this were given as part of a dowry for the bride. And so, in essence, Mary is giving up her dowry. She's surrendering her life to the one that she loves in full devotion. There will be no one else. Family, future husbands, household friends. She metaphorically becomes the bride of Christ in this text. She puts Jesus first in her life. Where's Jesus in your life? Are you willing to surrender yourself to him? And she risks her reputation all for love, knowing the possible repercussions. And then she goes even farther. She wipes the feet of Jesus with her hair. Wow. We all know that the Jewish custom was that women were not to expose their hair in public. And so she risks it all again in an act of extravagant love and wipes the feet of Jesus with her own hair. And you see, the hair that she has is her strength. It's her empowerment, it's her glory, it's her intimacy, it's her prayer shawl. And so she is, in essence, anointing Jesus' feet and wiping them with her hair as a symbolic act of Jesus is about ready to go to battle. And she wants to anoint him with the Holy Spirit on his way to the cross and into resurrection life. Now think about that metaphor of feet for a minute. That metaphor of feet is important, isn't it? What do feet represent? Well, for Mary, it was her walk with God, her walk with Jesus. For us, it's our walk with Jesus. Sometimes joyful, sometimes bitter. But always loving. It was an act of discipleship. So Jesus notes that she's preparing him for burial and just as in the breaking of the glass in the, in the wedding ceremony, there's that trust that Mary pours out. Trust that this won't be the end, that there'll be something new in the be, a new beginning. Her faith is confirmed, and it's a faith that's not just, again, a traditional faith. It's not about ritual. It's not about religion. Look, folks, Jesus didn't go to the cross so that we could be religious. That's not the purpose. He went to the cross to draw us into a new relationship so that Jesus could be the center of our lives, to show us the way, the truth, and the life, to lead us to the will of God and to fulfill the plans and the promises that God has for you in life. But to do that, you have to be like Mary, loving extravagantly. There is no cost to be counted. You have to give it all to Jesus, all of it, despite what others may say or think. For Jesus is the bridegroom, and we, I know guys, male or female, we are the bride. The church is the bride of Christ. It's a love story, folks. It's a beautiful love story, and one author of a children's book said, the Bible isn't about a book of rules. It's a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story, a love story of a brave, brave prince who leaves his palace, who leaves his throne, who leaves everything behind to rescue the one he loves. God loves his children. He would move heaven and earth to be near them, always. Whatever happened, whatever it cost him, he would always love them. He would always love you. And so, it is a wonderful love story unfolding before us. 
You know, as followers of Jesus Christ, we should learn from Mary's example. We should love extravagantly. That means loving the Lord with all your mind, all your soul, all your heart, all your body, all your life. Turn it over to God. Give it to Him. And He'll care for you. He'll protect you. He'll bless you. He'll see you through the valleys in life. Give it to God and enter into that beautiful love story. Anointing Him with your life. Anointing Him with all of you. You see, we're companions of Jesus. We're partners in Jesus. And He gives us the resurrection life. A new life. So be passionate about your relationship with Jesus. Be consumed with your relationship with Jesus. Be serious about and committed in your relationship with Jesus. Love those who God puts in your path as a church and as an individual. Surrender your life because love isn't an abstract. It's an action. It's a concrete way in which we can bless Jesus with our own lives and be a part of God's beautiful story unfolding in the world. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you you have called us into a special relationship, much like a relationship that's reflected in our marriages, in our committed, deep relationships, where we give all of ourselves. But Lord, you know that the hardest thing to do is let go of control. The hardest thing is to surrender. The hardest thing is to trust, for we always want to take those things back. We want to do things our way. Forgive us our shortcomings and shape us and mold us to be the people that you call us to be. To be the bride of Christ. To love extravagantly. To love recklessly. Both you and others who you place in our path. We praise you, Lord, for the work you're doing. For the anointing in our lives. It's all in Jesus' name. Amen. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created Oh
sound issues and hopefully the sound quality is better today and you're able to understand me more clearly and all the things going on here at the church. Uh, we'll continue to, to tweak and make uh, improvements in the quality of our production in the coming weeks as we worship online until further notice. Also, if you have feedback, questions, comments about today's message or the service about Cassidy and the fellowship here, please feel free to make comments. And also uh, share this message with someone who needs the hope that's contained within it. Uh, please feel free to, to do all of those things as we know that no matter what comes our way, the coronavirus, problems in our personal lives, issues throughout the world, wars, violence, hatred, abuse, whatever it is, God has conquered it. God is still in control. So step out in faith and don't be consumed by fear and panic during this time in our lives. Know that God has got this. He's larger than a virus. He's larger than your problems. He's larger than anything you may face or the world may face. Amen. Amen. So now I invite you to go in peace acting out of a reckless, extravagant love for God and for others, giving all of yourself, asking God during this time of Lent as we prepare for the resurrection on Easter Sunday to search your heart, to help you to let go of those things that are holding you back from fully giving yourself. Be surrounded by the love and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and be empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 